Michigan State University and Professor Tarabara is full professor at Michigan State University in the Department of Environmental Engineering and uh, I would say uh, expert in uh, water, membrane water treatment, Ex expert and well known not only in the United States but worldwide actually because he has such collaborations and relations with many universities uh, around the world. And they planned just cooperation between Agricultural University of Georgia and Michigan State University. And it's ended up with a Fulbright scholarship and starting from of Professor Tarabara and starting from 2014. And during three years, he spent about six months on site here at Agricultural University. Just uh, first time it was for a couple of months again, month, two months, three months, and so on. And uh, what he managed is uh, the laboratory we have here, water treatment laboratory, and the uh, most important thing was that uh, students were involved, quite enough students in these activities, and uh, actually, of course, uh, Professor Tarabar would tell himself and give the information to all those years and our relations, but briefly I would say that it was very, very useful uh, for us and now actually it's ended at this level that we have already submitted the paper uh, where our, except of group members, where our students are also uh, just authors in, in, in that paper, it's sent and actually uh, will be soon published in quite a good journal uh, and we have positive responses from uh, from referees actually in next month we have to look at this, this paper. Okay, I'm happy, we are happy, he's here, we have this kind of cooperation and collaboration with Tarabara and about future plans, about what he has done together with us, he will, he will just tell us during his presentation. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let's let's Zalan Vennyeva. Yes, yes. Hello, hello, Paso. Okay, I can take the stage. Thank you very much. Zero Paso Agrarian University is student level. Zero Paso professor level. Administrazis te nam šo mrego. Zero pa so kolege v čemu mrego bar. Med zajem veni veni very happy. Rom vinkopet vinkopeti sekat veloši. Kvalf vinkopeti sekat veloši. Продолжение Ме уред а да се схрас од мозда ова двамети. Не ме се мет 2014. And it was an invitation from from academic kids as as professor. Мет мет ќе ви поинти да го. So I'm very happy to be here. I just wish Didi Patilia the Zlier as a Serbomba to be to be here. We can put the current situation. I'm very much looking forward to building our relationship and establishing connections between Michigan State and Agriculture University of Georgia. The first time when I met with with. But on Nikaha, when you did that, my life took a turn. Right? It was a new page in my life. Uh, it was um, a change both for professional 
my professional life, but also personal life. So I made many friends I couldn't wish for a better job for friends. I'm truly happy to be here. Thank you for giving me this uh, chance and this opportunity. Um, so I feel like I'm almost Georgian. I just need to open my pronunciation a little more. Ukraine Levar, my grand America, I mean Ukraine Levar. This is why my last name is funny. Uh, but, okay, I will, I will uh, talk a little bit about my research. I will describe what we do at Michigan State, and then I would like to spend more time describing what I, I see as possibilities for us working together, continue working with with my colleagues here, find new connections, raise funding educate, do good work educating you, our students, maybe establish some bilateral links and exchange programs. So let me begin. I'll keep it relatively short. So first of all, where I'm from, I'm from Professor Michigan State. It's a very big university. We have 50,000 students, more than 50,000 students. We have uh, 200 different programs of study. We have 260 plus study abroad programs. So our students go to 260 different programs outside the United States. We're number one in the United States. Our budget is about 700 million annual research expenditures budget. It's not the endowment, it's just how much we spend doing research, almost a billion dollars. It's, it's, a, it's significant. And even for, for, for Michigan, it's rather significant. And then we're also very good in environmental science and engineering in the area where we collaborate with, with Agraruli University. So we're number five in the world according to Shanghai International Rankings, which is fairly good. So Michigan is right here. I don't know if you can see it well. It's this uh, green, uh, green state, which is made of two peninsulas, this lower peninsula and upper peninsula. And you can see how the lower peninsula looks like a mitten. Commitment, Russian uh, will be Vadishka. Um, and so when you meet somebody in Michigan, and we call ourselves Michiganders, right? Like Kapkwili, Ukrainali, Michiganders. So you have you say, okay, where are you from? You show your hand and you say, I'm from here, I'm from here, I'm from here to describe where in the state you are from. Right, and so this is Michigan, and across the lake Michigan, you see the state of Wisconsin. And some of the major events took place in Wisconsin, which sort of served as a watershed moment for the entire uh, environmental engineering community, water community in North America. I'll describe this in a minute. So what happened, and this is actually, um, that I found this web page in CNN archives. It dates back to 1996, imagine. There was internet already at the time, and CNN was archiving its pages. and so. What this web page describes are events which took place over here in Wisconsin in 1993, where a water treatment plant malfunctioned and a pathogen, so called cryptosporidium pardon, it's a very small microorganism, broke through the treatment system and made it into the municipal water treatment with water supply. And many people died, 400 people, more than 400 people died, mostly infants mostly elderly immunocompromised people right so and it's because even the systems we designed to the best of our ability are not foolproof are not ideal there's human error but there is inherently reliability and uh, risk concerns and so this is this event really served as a watershed moment for changes in the water industry we started to move away from traditional conventional technologies like sand filtration towards new technologies like membrane filters and so forth. So this slide just to illustrate that water quality is a major international concern. You have a large fraction of the world population living, uh, struggling with having access to uh, clean and safe water. That's a day significant challenge to all of us, not only in developing countries, uh, but also developed countries that face their own share of concerns. And so, our, and the, what's interesting about water science is, is that an environmental professional in general, is it's, it's dialectic nature, that each new success gives rise to a new challenge. 
So we success at detecting things in water. We develop our instru instruments to be better and higher quality. And we start detecting things we didn't know they were there. So we now know that some of the antibiotics we consume end up in our water treatments, right? The systems, and they're not designed to remove them. We know plastics are there. We know there are microfluidants which are truly dangerous, and we're not equipped to prevent them from entering the water supply. So this is interesting dialectic uh, dynamics to it, where the more we know, the more aware we become of the dangers we face, and the more we need to know. It's rather, and so this is what we thought pathogens would look like. Look like it was. This was not that long time ago. It's actually an engraving gravura from Detroit Institute of Art. It's a famous French artist called Emilio Leno. He, he he made this as a miniature of a pathogen. So we know that they look more like this. This is more recent picture of a pathogen, and so we know that viruses look more like that. And, and so we, we continue to evolve to learn more about the risks we are facing, and we develop new technologies to mitigate those risks. And risks can be of long-term routine nature, where we just keep polluting our environment. We put uh, you know, contaminated water into our rivers. Uh, we have uh, oil spills, uh, which continue to occur because imperfect technologies, which occur as a one-time catastrophic event, maybe you remember Deepwater Horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010. Okay. So this is, and this is a picture, these are pictures from, from our state, the state of Michigan, where we had an oil spill into a river which feeds into the Lake of Michigan. And you can see, you know, if we see ducks here, uh, they, they probably died, you know, because there was just no way not enough capacity to help every bird. So um, there's a lot of work for environmental engineers to do. Back in 1961, long time ago, President Kennedy said that uh, said that we have we have if we could only desalinate seawater and make fresh water, that would solve our problems. But guess what? We can do it now really, really well and relatively inexpensive. It's still too expensive for some countries, but it's relatively inexpensive. The bigger challenge now is treating industrial waste streams. So for example, this is in, an interesting slide. If you take a look, this is how much oil is wasted domestically in, in the United States every year. Okay. And this is data from 2000. And this is how much oil the United States imported from Iraq. This is how much the United States imported from Venezuela. So if we could only not waste the oil that we do waste, Without more supplies, this might be a solution, you know, to Middle Eastern crisis. This is the, the question is so political. And so, what as engineers we do, and this is what essentially our project with that movie has been about, is I'm working on this thin red line, this movie with this. So we try to develop technologies that ensure safe drinking water supply and ensure protection of the environment from the wastes. This is actually a picture from the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. This is where the, the spill occurred. You have this oil just gushing out of the, out of the broken pipe. And so what we do in my group, we develop the membrane technologies. And uh, membrane, you can think of it as a filter. And this is what uh, we are using also in, in a Grunier laboratory in Gatwick and Gatwick's lab. We have a now the treatment system that we use to test various membranes vis-a-vis -vis water sources in Georgia. So we work, for example, with water from Aragui, from uh, BDCC. We look at how different technologies are capable of treating this water to high standards. And these are just different research topics which are active in my group. I'm not going to dwell on them to any significant extent, I'll just say that we work with both material science of, of, the, of filtration and on the process design. This is more engineering aspect, and this is more science. So my undergraduate degree is in physics, so I think, uh, and I think some of you here are physicists, I think it's an excellent degree on which to build and then move on to engineering. And so if you take a, it looks, the me a membrane looks like a piece of paper, if you cut it, and then take a powerful microscope and look at the cross-section, you will find out that the membrane looks like that. It 
it's actually it's actually asymmetric. You have a very thin layer here on top, which is dense, and this is where separation occurs. So water goes to the membrane in this direction. And if the membrane is good, then for example, a bacterium or a virus is rejected at the surface. Water goes through, but all the bad stuff is kept up, up above the membrane surface. This is how it works. It's rather simple. And uh, but you can design these filters to have different pores. If the pore is very large, right here, you're talking about you don't need to use membrane, you can use sample. Once you shrink the pores to submicron range, you go to outer filtration, under filtration, and you go to reverse osmosis. So if you go to a store, like this, this this water right here, it was probably purified by reverse osmosis by this technology. That's my guess. I'm not sure. About Um, let me see. And so we study how these filters can be used to remove various pollutants. And one type of pollutant, as you probably <coughs> expect of interest for us, is oil. Common wisdom says oil water do not mix, right? Oil rises to the surface. In fact, this is not quite true. They do mix. If you add some oil, for example, vegetable oil, you want to make, you know, salad in your kitchen. And then you put some vegetable oil, right? And it will mix with the juice from, you know, cucumbers and tomatoes to some extent, right? Now, it will still be largely separated. Now, if you mix it in a mixer, like, mm -hmm. very strongly, right? You, what you will see is that oil will get into tiny droplets. And those are very difficult to take out of water. Problem is, if oil spill occurs into river or lake, this Tiny droplets are actually dangerous for fish or aquatic life, so it needs to be removed. But it's very difficult to do so because they're small. And so we study how these uh, oil droplets behave on the surface of a, for example, of a filter. And so we actually take videos. Each of these circles is, a, is an oil droplet. The tiny ones flying by are also oil droplets. And so we look at their behavior. Uh, kinetics of their behavior in real time and try to design this membrane, which is underneath, to make sure the oil is removed uh, completely and the filtered water is oil free. So we design the surfaces, we manipulate the chemistry to make sure the droplets coalesce and get removed without getting through the membrane. It's just one example of what we do. There's a larger uh, another video where you can see the sudden onset of coalescence uh, you know a few seconds into into the video we added some salt we made it seawater out of fresh water and droplets began coalescing into larger ones you'll see it you can see it now already see how they grow they coalesce and then once they're large enough they're swept off the membrane surface by the fall so this is one example of the kind of work we do. The problem, another problem with, with filters, and right now I'll talk about later about the projects that we work on with the VCC and Aragri River Water, where we look at membranes and see how well they work. The problem with membranes is that all the stuff you separate it tends to accumulate on the membranes. So this is called fouling. Um, so how do we deal with it? The approach we take is we have so-called snake skin idea. So just like a snake sheds its skin, we can we develop this very thin coatings for the membrane. So that once this stuff accumulated in the membrane surface and this fouling layer on the top, we just remove the underlying skin and all the bad stuff goes off the membrane surface. And then we can grow the skin again, just like the snake does. So surface renewal idea. It can be quite easily implemented. Right? So this is this renewable skin. And once stuff is on the surface, we just do simple regeneration approach. It goes off together with the farmers, we grow a new skin. This is one way of making membranes a bit more sustainable. You can use it as well, and that's what we do, to detect viruses in water. If we're not trying to purify water, but instead we try to see if there are viruses, we can use these skins to capture viruses out of water, and then once we regenerate the skin, 
We take the viruses to qPCR, we detect if there are any viruses in the water with filter. We've published quite a bit in this, on the subject in applied in, in microbiology, for example, in good journals. So as material scientists, we design membranes to be reactive. They normally do just one job, that of separation. We make them do something else. We make them to do functional membranes. We add another function, for example, reactivity. So we take graphene and we modify it with reactive nanoparticles. For example, gold and palladium. This is the specific example we have here. So that is hierarchical structure. First layer is graphene, second layer gold nanoparticles, and third layer in the hierarchy is palladium islands on the surface of the gold. And then we put it into a membrane like that. We take this image how it looks in real life. We take it, we put it into the membrane, and we have a membrane which reacts pollutants away when they go through the membrane with water. Then we also coat the membrane surface with reactive particles, again with the idea of making the membrane do something else for us. We try to make this coating conforming, so that portion of the We also try to make sure every reactive particle is separate from another. If any of you look at a strawberry in a microscope, and this is agricultural university, so probably some of you did, you will see that this is how a strawberry looks like. It's individual little seeds actually separate one from another. In English, they call it a key. I didn't know that it's in the dictionary. And so we create membrane surfaces which are coated with these reactive particles. So we can do some cool chemical reactions together at the same time with a separation. As I mentioned, we're also very much interested in the work on virus removal, inactivation, and detection. What we show, and this is, this is an, I don't know, if, can you see this? It's a human adenovirus. So you know when you get cough, it can be due to adenovirus infection. So we are set up to work with this virus. This our laboratory is biosafety level two, so which means we can work with, we can work with human viruses. What we, what this graph shows, I'm not going to talk about specific curves here. The basic idea is this: when you filter water, for example, for sample. So the see the water you drink here, okay, it comes from the treatment plant, which is run by Georgia Water and Power. You know this company, right? <coughs> what these guys, the way these guys purify this water for you, they take it from BDCC, and then they pass it through sample. They do some other things, okay? They do chlorination, I think. But mainly they pass it through sand now. And sand works okay to some extent. However, what we show is that what removes viruses is not sand itself is the stuff which clogs sand filter. So when sand filter works, it accumulates, it removes things in water, right? And these things remain in the filter. It's them that are responsible for virus. So if you want to cre clean the sand filter to in 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 increase water flow through it, okay, you can do that. But the price you're gonna pay is that right after cleaning, the viruses will go through. It's, a, it's an interesting, result which which major implications for the treatment system design. We published this in the water research a couple of years ago and the paper has been cited well. So what I would like to do next is describe a couple of projects that um, we worked with with my colleagues uh, from Tunisia. So one example, example now I'll give you two examples. There are more, but I'm showing sure them today. Um, is this uh, project uh, which was funded by Chicago Stavelli Foundation, but also by CIDF and Georgia Early Career Scholars Program. Two key participants from the Georgian side were Ms. Olasayashvili and Eka Jain. And uh, another participant was <coughs> actually from the Luga Center, uh, Adam Papuna Kotorashvili. And then that's my stuff. And so these are the different uh, organizations involved in this project. It's completed already. This was submitted the final report with ECAS and my input, and I think Evan provided some input as well. Um, and so what we did, we actually, the project was, as you can see from the title, this was funded, I think it was $50,000, 
I think it was $50,000. It was well funded initially. The goal there was to understand how virology expertise can be combined with engineering expertise to improve water treatment system design. That's a very broadly defined goal. And so specifically, we decided, we'll look into this question. OK, you have human viruses. They are, they're dangerous. They're difficult to work with. You try to work with them, you can get infected. Um, you need to go through special difficult training to do job responsibly and well. And so um, what if we had something which is just like this virus, but safe? And so fortunately, and this is a truly one of the uh, unique aspects, uh, trademarks of Georgian uh, science, is expertise in biology. We have the Yale Institute. We have experts at the various other institutions who, who, who are good virologists. And so we thought, OK, let's team up. Let's have this team of engineers and neurologists to see if we can choose these appropriate surrogates, sort of mimicking model or organisms which behave just like human biases, but are safe. And bacteriophages, bacterial viruses, are such models. They are, of course, threat to the bacteria, which are their hosts, but they're safe with respect to humans. And so uh, Dr. Vasilevsky visited our University, we went to different locations in Michigan, rivers, ponds. Uh, here I stand next to a pipe with effluent from wastewater treatment plant. We collected samples as well. And this alone isolated a whole suit, a, a large number of phages from these different water, waters. And these are some examples, transmission uh, like microscopes, microscope images of these phages. You can see Lake Lansing, which is close to. MSU campus. But for example, uh, Black Sea, it's a pathogen that obviously was not isolated in the United States, it was isolated in Black Sea in Georgia. So we combined various phages from the Ayilava library together with those that were so isolated in Michigan. And then we characterized them in terms of their charge. You can, <coughs> zeta potential is a measure of charge, electric charge. In terms of their size and the, the magnitude of the circle corresponds to the size of the virus. So for example, this virus is relatively small, this one is relatively large. And in terms of whether they're hydrophobic or hydrophobic. And then we said, OK, probably this is a good surrogate for this virus, which is human adenovirus. This, is, this project uh, has been completed. We're still working on, on, on the publication. And, um, should be out soon. Second project is our work on developing water treatment technologies for Georgian water sources. So this is, of course, Tsetapas Lermantava. And this is, it's a very good translation, I think, in my opinion, of this poetry into English. And we're all very much familiar with this, uh, with this particular part of Georgia, of course. Um, and then, so we went there, together with Dr. Didi Bonizzi, took some samples. We saw a horse. That was a beautiful day. And we took this water sample <coughs> to our uh, to other university. And this is the water we've been filtering. Um, so these are different locations. Um, it's like that was just one of the locations. We also collected uh, from Java and some other other locations in Hawaii. <coughs> um, these are students we have all involved. So. We actually <laughs> we have we relied on students, uh, ag 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 agronomy students, uh, as key drivers of, of project success. They participated in sample collection. They participated in experiments on water filtration. Three uni students as well. Three uni two physicists. Physicists. Thank you. This is good. Important point. This. Uh, there was that, yes. Uh, and then we also took samples from another water body. This is actually where Georgia Water and Power, the company which treats water from the municipality of Tbilisi, takes water from. We came here and we took water samples at different locations. Okay. And these are just various <coughs> contributors um, to, to the lake, see, I should say. 
So we took different to several table sampling sampling events. You can see that the examples here. This is Rakhi uh, I don't know if Rakhi is here or not. Yeah. So, so Archiri and Rakhi participated in this project directly. And so I don't know who these guys so. are. But anyway, again, this was a very student-based project. And so we submitted the paper, as, as Dr. Matthew really pointed out, to a decent journal, a very good journal, actually. And so it's been revised. We were asked to revise it. So we are quite hopeful to be accepted soon. And you can see stars here, which mark uh, students from, from here. So Archie, Iraqi, uh, Sandro, the United States, and uh, well, actually, hold on. Uh, okay. What always what? Over where is Arthur? It's not clear. Yeah, this is Arthur. So Arthur, Iraqi, Sandro, Archie. And actually, Tamri Koz is also here. I should be here as well. And then we see Georgi Kitinidze So these are additional uh, images of what our students did in the lab. So they've set up the filtration system. They've looked at the design of the pre-treatment system for membrane filtration. What do we do with water? So it's ready to be filtered by a membrane. And then, so, what I think we can be doing together is, I think, in, in collaboration between our universities, we can set up seminar series. I've done some of this uh, in 2014 uh, when I was here on a Fulbright scholarship. So this can be done. Uh, it can be done through teleconference. We can leverage uh, mutual visits to offer seminars to educate our colleagues about our institutions. I'd be happy to tell you more, for example, about my colleagues at Michigan State. Again, we are really good in the area of environment. And uh, there are multiple opportunities for collaboration, not only in the environment. We are very much like Aguni, by the way. We're agricultural university. Our heritage is an agricultural university. We used to be called Agricultural University of Michigan. Relatively recently, we became just university. And this agricultural heritage is very much alive. It, in, in large measure, it defines our identity and priorities so forth. So I think it's a it's a very um, good match in terms of um, vision, educational philosophy, research emphases and thrusts between our institutions. So we can also promote faculty exchange, and you can see here uh, very good colleagues of mine, uh, uh, at Michigan State on the visit. Uh, they both gave presentations. Uh, they well attended in different departments. Um, and so here I have talks with uh, a good friend of mine and a colleague of mine, Irene Zagaraki, who's an environmental microbiologist. So I'm sure they have a lot to talk about together. So, and then uh, uh, this was actually also visited and gave a seminar at Michigan State. And I hope to see more of you coming to Michigan State as visitors as seminar speakers, as uh, participants in joint research projects. And I hope to bring my colleagues here as well. Uh, so this is just uh, uh, announcements of ECAS and Marina's uh, talks at Michigan State. Different departments. This is my unit and Dr. Tidiashvili uh, gave a talk, which is a funny name. Uh, we have a special seminar series with a funny name, Special Bad Luck Club. It's a very active community, people who study pathogens. And uh I was asked to give a talk in the seminar series. So of course we need you know to to, to enable these joint activities we need to have funding. This is pretty much the bottom line and without funding not much is done, not much can be done. And so uh, there are various ways, uh, I guess, sources of money which are potentially available. None of it is easy, but unless you try, you never succeed. And so we've been trying, and we're going to try more. We've been successful to some extent. In some cases, not successful, such as life. You win some, you lose some. But uh, some potential <coughs> projects which might be of joint interest, uh, beneficial use of uh, wine industry waste, homes. In Ukrainian, you call it Jumika, when you make wine and generate this stuff. It's actually, by and large, discarded as a waste, but as a useful 
you can extract the useful, it's, it's a resource. You can reuse it. And in particular, in specifically, it can be reused in more different applications. This is of interest to me. I know it's of interest to my colleagues. Um, this one, another area, and this might be of particular interest for the environmental biologists amongst us, is looking at virus adhesion. So I didn't mention this in my slides, but what we do now at Michigan State, we look at how viruses, phages, but also human viruses, attach to surfaces such as, for example, uh, wall paint. This paint right here on the wall. We look at how they attach to surf surfaces like lipstick. It's very interesting. Because nobody think about designing lipstick to be repellent to pathogens. In fact, what we find out, this results haven't been published, but I can tell you, lipsticks are very hydrophobic, right? Water builds up on the surface, right? Which, mean, which means they're like magnets for viruses. Hydrophobic surfaces attract. Just like paint, by the way. You make paint to be hydrophobic, to repel water, to prevent, to prevent water intrusion into the wall. This is good to keep the walls dry. But it's bad if you're in a hospital and you want the wall, the wall to be clean of pathogens, for example. So paints need to be designed differently if you plan to use them in a hospital or to paint your house from outside. I think for veterinary applications, we discussed with the Dr. Alessandro potential of this research on virus adhesion is very interesting, is very, very, very significant, I should say. Imagine if we can design a, a surface which mimics hair. Uh, for example, of a cow, right? The same keratin surface. We can study how viruses, which are important uh, in agriculture, which are bovine, uh, bovine viruses, you know, how they attach to the surface of, of cow skin. <coughs> and what we can do, maybe simply cl cleaning procedure to prevent cow from contracting this viral diseases. So, anyway, two areas I thought I would offer to you, and of course we have many other ideas, but Two specific ones I thought bring to your attention is viral adhesion, and we have very, very unique capability in my laboratory to measure virus adhesion. We use a super sensitive mass balance to do that. I'm not going to go into much detail. And wine industry of obvious practical, economical, but also emotional, I think, uh, value for Georgians. I'm almost done. Uh, am, I, uh, does, am I good on time? Uh, I think so, yeah. yes. Okay. Right. Cool. Okay, I just need a couple more minutes. Maybe. So, another, I think, possibility, because this this funding is really difficult to get. There are really few opportunities to bring money for just Georgian US collaboration, bilateral collaboration. There are some possibilities, but they're not many. And so one way around this difficulty <coughs> is to look for ways of funding collaborations which are multilateral. This is an example of our collaboration between Ukraine and my colleagues in, in, in Ukraine, and then uh, my colleagues here in, in Georgia, and my group at Michigan State. So this is a paper published relatively recently. So there are funds which are available in you know, Horizon 2020 European funding where Ukraine and Georgia can be partners and the US can participate. We're not going to get money, but we can get mobility funds, United States, I mean, for Georgia and for, for example, for Ukraine, there's actual money for, from the European Union fund to your research laboratory. So that's a possibility. Uh, this is an example of a recent proposal we submitted. I have uh, uh, three amazing colleagues. So um, Natalia Berikova, she is a professor at Texas Tech. She's from Ukraine originally. And then Lisa uh, Goni, she's she is a uh, doctor of jurisprudence from Harvard University. She changed her profession in midlife and became master of wine. And she became one of the top masters of wine in the world. Her passion is Georgian wine. She is uh, one of the biggest promotion, promoters of Georgian wine in the world. <coughs> she was a Fulbright in Georgia in 2017. You know her, Lisa? Okay. She is unbelievable. All of them are. And then there is, of course, Patti from the uh, International School of Economics at Greece right here on Vasily Barnovi's picture. I stayed there, so I know this place. <coughs> and so we applied for this. Uh, it's not a lot of money, but this is 
one way to get collaboration going and then maybe build on that. And a general idea, let's build on our leverage of professional and regional networks. So we have connections here in Georgia, perhaps in the region, and maybe you collaborate with, with other other researchers in this neighborhood. I know that, for example, ECA has visited the Vista recently, right? There we go. Okay. <laughs> and, and uh, so the regional networks. And we also will collaborate with different, different groups. We have collaborations in, in Norway, in Turkey, in France, in Singapore even. And so when we bring these two networks or three networks together, we may do something that's otherwise not, not doable, not feasible. This is attractive uh, for funding agencies. And this actual specific NSF call for the United States National Science Foundation call for proposals where they ask you to develop this international network to network collaboration. That line is going to be October. We can consider applying for that. And I don't know if um, the exact structure of this funding, but the idea is that. And so this is my group. This is a bit of a dated picture, um, maybe 2017, maybe 2016. And my group was, this was my group at the time. Um, this guy is in the Europe, he's now in the US Army. And we have American Iranian Iranian. American, 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 Korean. This guy is from Puerto Rico. No, no. American, Mexican, Vietnamese, Chinese. So I say, if you want to see the world, come to Michigan State. And then I would like to acknowledge also not only my group members, but most of the work I just talked quite actually really well. I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues here from Georgia. And I'm very happy with you all here. Thank you very much. Thank you.
uh, with your support, approval, and uh, appreciation. So I, I will. I, I think we need to make some. It's more theatralic, so it's, it's, <laughs> academic world is uh, defined. Uh, so. How it fits you, but I, I think it's fine. Yeah. So we studied your your size, and so it's not by not by chance. So. And uh, this is the this is the pin. Okay. Hopefully, proudly wear. Uh, we, we hope that uh, it's uh, just uh, one of the stages of our cooperation, which should be really recognized, appreciated, but it's not, it's not the happy end, so it's just a happy beginning. So we will uh, get back to this note to, be, to remain happy. We recently underwent, I can tell you, we recently underwent um, state authorization process, and uh, um, the chairman was a French <coughs> professor, and the uh, uh, University has the best result in Georgia, uh, which can only be repeated, it cannot be done better. Uh, and one of, one of the but the findings of him was that it's strange that all persons are laughing and happy. For us, it's not strange, so it's, it's, it's a lifestyle. So please join this lifestyle and uh, be proud. Of